Hello, friends. My name is David Rice. Welcome back to Dentistry Unmasked. Here, as always, with... Hey, Pam Maragliano Muniz. What is up this week? All the things are up, but especially I think what's up is dentists don't like hygienists and hygienists don't like dentists. Can we just talk about all those things? Way to just throw that out there. But yeah, Let's no, I, it. it's a it's a thing. And I think that's really sucky because I feel like I've spent Me so too. much time in my career trying to talk about the value of the dental hygienist when the reality is they don't freaking like you anyway. So we had to bring on some dental hygienists. So we're going to, you know, two dentists here talking to two hygienists. We're going to go head to head and have this conversation. So we have you guys, I mean, you're known by so many different names, the Diamond Dental Girls, but technically that's not their name. They are El Diamante, right? Hygiene coaches. We've got Danielle Avila and Laura Betancourt. Welcome, ladies. We're happy to have you here. Oh, happy to be here. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you. So let's jump right to it. So I know that there's this divide. Everybody knows that there's this divide. I was taught that there was this divide in dental hygiene school, like 25-ish I don't know, maybe be six, 26 years ago now. It's scary. And, um, you know, it's us versus them. And so we know the like, yes, there's the practice owner and the team and like, therefore it's us versus them. But like, what are dentists doing? Give us some like specific things that a dentist or you, a listener could be doing that could be driving your freaking team crazy and maybe <laughs> making them compelled to consider leaving. Hit us. I know. Um, dentists do not give the autonomy or um, freedom for hygienists to be their own provider. Tell they us more. Will, um, so a hygienist will spend an hour with their patients expressing to them that you know, their oral health is related to their systemic health and they have active disease going on and that they need treatment for whatever it may be. And then the dentist will come in and say, oh, hey, everything looks great. See you in six months. Angry. Totally, totally mind blowing. Yeah, that's a thing. It is. Yeah, a thing. it totally is a thing. When you have that super long conversation, you're super excited about all of the things, even simple as the water pick. And a doctor comes in at the end is like, yeah, I don't really agree. And it's just like, how could you have that? I just spent so much time with my patient telling and educating them on the water pick. And then you're coming in and you're, you're not backing me up. It's just, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. David, why are we doing this? Is this because we're afraid to hurt our patients' feelings or, I mean, like, I don't know why. Cause like, I obviously have a very specific opinion about this topic, but like, why do we do this? Like why? It sounds like a, like a stupid thing to do. Yeah. I think most dentists have approval addiction. They just want to be liked. So if they can come in and rescue and save the patient and be the good girl or the good guy in this thing, then yay, look at me. And I get to feel good for 30 seconds instead of doing the right thing and standing by your team. Cause I don't know. Do you, do you do that? I know you don't do this, Pam. I, I know we don't do it in our practice, but, but like, what's your take? I don't know. I feel like the only thing that I do, well, okay, I'm sure that I'm okay. I mean, I do I'm not going to say the only thing because I'm sure there's plenty of things, but I know there's one thing I do that annoys the crap out of my hygienist is like I have like this small handful of patients that I like actually really like talking to or mm. they're friends that have joined the practice and you know they're they've joined as patients and I just can't help myself and I blab to them for like way longer than I should. And there's people that want to like pull me by my ponytail and drag me out of the room because I'm going to make my hygienist late. Different situation. But yeah, I feel like we should not do that. Maybe we should just like make a call to action. So call to action number one, let's not do that. Get out of your own way. If the hygienist identifies that this patient has a disease process going on, which inflammation, even one bleeding point, is a disease process, don't undo it. Okay, next. What else are we I doing that drives you guys nuts? Danielle? I mean, I think that you kind of already said that, like spending that too much time, like we already are crunched for time sometimes, and then the doctor will come in. And yes, sometimes they will agree, but then they're going on their own tangent for like the next, you know, five to 10 minutes where we're already kind of running behind. So um, what else does the doctor do? Reel them in a little bit. Yeah, totally reel them in a little bit. 
Um, I think that David kind of said it too. Just maybe, I don't know if they have to always be right, I think, some, you know, and kind of, I don't know how to say it in, in, in the terms that, you know, the hygienist only knows so much and I'm the doctor, so I know better than the hygienist. I've dealt with that. Ooh. I think that's true for many dentists, unfortunately. I think dentists are largely, sorry, dentists, um, insecure humans, hmm. right? So I, mean, I we feel went, like I got no. to see both sides of this. And like, yeah, do you fight with yourself? Are you like hygiene? No. Pam and prosthodontist Pam? No, I don't. I feel like I went to dental school feeling like I was a hygienist. I went into dental school as a hygienist. And I, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. There's two like distinct things that really stood out for me. Number one, like there was never a mention of the dental team. And I remember going after one of the lectures, talking to one of my teachers, and I was like, when are you going to talk about how to utilize the team and like what the team knows, you know, like the things that you can expect of them, you know, in a practice. And they were like, what? And I was like, no, like I was a hygienist. And I feel like there's things that you guys are talking about that I know like way more than we're talking about right now, why don't we, like, you guys should talk about what the hygienist knows. So like, you don't have to recreate the wheel. And they were like, I, that's not an accreditation. You need to just walk away. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay. And then the other thing that I like thought was crazy was we spent like a stupid amount of time learning how to explore and then scale a sextant. And you're sort of taught in dental school, like the 11, 12 is for mesial surfaces. Have at it. And it, there was no like real education about like root morphology and like, I mean, enough to pass the boards, but like talking about instrumentation and like doing these things like that was for, I guess, perio residency. But like there's things that dentists aren't really taught that hygienists are taught. Yet dentists assume they already know more when they literally have not had that education. Hmm. Interesting. I I find too that um, for whatever reason, in certain offices, there's a divide between everybody, right? There's the dentist, there's the hygienist, there's the admin, there's the assistants, and nobody's working together. So so why why is that? And I think it it would be amazing if the dentist took on that role of leadership to include everybody, to create that culture, like Dr. Pam, I mean, you, you do that beautifully. You're such an incredible leader where you just cultivate excellence within everybody and you want the team to be together. I, um, I think that is one thing that butts heads between hygienist and dentist. And if there was more leadership within practices that could eliminate that. So Pam, simple call to action. I like where you like where we started with all of this. Simple tip or tip or trick that you've brought to the table that helps your team know that you're all on the same side. Mm -hmm. You have to start with yourself. <clears throat> you know, I feel like we go into our practices and we have this expectation that we don't actually share with everybody. And you like point fingers at everybody else, but like, what do they say? Like you point one finger, I don't know, like three, at least three are pointing back at you. I don't know what you're doing with your thumb, but anyway, um, I know now everyone's like, what? Anyway, <laughs> no, but so like, I realized that part of that was my fault. And it was because I didn't talk about what my expectations were. And I didn't share what my practice was about. I just sort of like had what I wanted. And I started taking the CE to get me where I wanted to be, which I'll never be where I want to be and whatever. But like, I never shared that with anybody. So I always say like, if, if you have this divide and you're you know, like your office is run by the one stubborn bull in the office and whatever, you need to start with yourself and start with, and it's vulnerable and it's, it's like crazy. It, it, like for me, it was like very vulnerable, creating a mission and a, and a vision for your practice and deciding what your practice is about. And once you know what your practice is about, you have to literally live by those words. And that includes creating this team around you that live by these words. And that might mean some casualties along the way. You might not keep every team member if they're not going to support 
the mission and the vision of the practice, but it's up to you as a leader to create it and then ultimately share it. Agreed. Agreed. Go ahead. I have, sorry, I, that just makes me think about how hygienists sometimes feel the lack or they don't feel valued in doing that right there by like looking inwards at yourself and speaking what you want for your, from your own practice would then in turn help the hygienist feel valued. I don't know. At least that did for me. Absolutely. No, I agree. You, you're surrounding yourself with your people, you know? So it's like, you know, there's people and then all of a sudden you appreciate them because they're doing the things that you want to see have like, to happen in your practice. So it, I feel like it's sort of an innate way that one hand washes the other. It's not about you need to be faster. You need to suck it up and use your dull instruments. It's not, a you know, it's, you know, you create, you know, what your non-negotiables are for your practice and everything sort of falls into place. So I think that that would certainly help make the world a better place. So, okay, I'm ready. Hit, hit me with more. What other things are you guys seeing? Because you guys work with, you coach teams, you coach dentists, you coach hygienists, and you hear like all, all the things that they say. So, you know, and you both have, I know, lived in that story where you both have had to leave your respective practices because your values didn't jive with that of the of the owners. So go ahead. Tell us more yeah. about what we're, you know, you're seeing out there that we should probably rethink as a practice owner. Yeah. So that kind of, yeah, I can relate right there to that. As far as growing as a hygienist, we see a lot of hygienists that do want to grow within their clinical career, implementing new innovations and technologies, and the doctor just shoots them down. So there's been many times that I've, you know, gone to the doctor and said, Hey, I'd love to implement lasers. I'd love to implement salivary diagnostics. And they're like, Nope, absolutely not. That's a liability. Or they come up with some excuse that is just seems so ridiculous. And it just frustrates you as a hygienist because you want to help your patients get healthy, but the doctor just doesn't support that. So, so when you ladies are working with a team how do you position a hygienist in their approach to the dentist that helps set them up for success as opposed to getting that sh immediate shutdown? Yeah, I love that question. I think it's a matter of having a productive conversation, right? Everything always starts with conversation and making sure, okay, well, are you both in alignment? What does the dentist want for their practice? have the dentist look inward, what are their goals? And then have the hygienist have that same conversation, have them look inward. What are your goals as a hygienist? What type of care do you want to provide? Making sure that everybody's in alignment and then, okay, now once everybody is in alignment, because sometimes let's be honest, people have to hash things out, right? You have to make sure that you're on the same page. And Dr. Pam, I can tell you want to say something. I do. Well, how do you do that? So, I mean, we all work in private practice. And so I know what happens. And this is, I mean, let's talk about, I just bought an assistance chair. This stupid chair has been <laughs> on a post-it for, I don't know, months. Like I took photos at a trade show, like, I don't know, six months or a year ago. I like sent it to everybody. We decided what chair we're going to get. Then it's like, all right, well, let's order the chair. Chair doesn't come. Hey, the chair get ordered? I don't know. All right. So let me write a post-it for the chair. And this whole thing is because we try to do so much on the fly that sometimes nothing gets done. You're talking about this conversation. This is not something that really can happen, right? Between patients or at a huddle. Like, how do you tell people like to have this conversation? Like, how do you how do you make that happen? Yeah. So we just tell the hygienist to send an email. For us, that's been the easiest way for them to really get the attention of the doctor and set up a time outside of work, like whether that be a phone conversation or an in-person conversation at the end of the day, when there's no patients there, there's no distractions. It's really being clear and concise about, you know, what your wants and needs are and setting the time aside to have those conversations. Do you, do you, is the email, the strategy, regardless of the size of the practice, if it's like myself and five other people, is it still an email or is that more on a bigger practice or multiple locations? 
I think it depends. Obviously, when it's a bigger practice, multiple locations, an email might be an easier way. If it's a smaller practice, you can, you know, in person say, hey, I would like to set up a specific time. Do you have availability next week at X, Y, and Z? So we can talk about this. And we've heard this at nauseum that dentists don't get an adequate education in business. Hmm. Hygienists probably get even less. Mm -hmm. No offense, but it's just, I think, a fact. Oh, absolutely. I've heard hygienists, and I've been in on panel discussions and different things where people have encouraged hygienists to come up with a business plan for a purchase. Like, oh, you spend X dollars on this. It's going to equal this, this, and this. How do you talk to hygienists about making that pre presentation? You know what I mean? Because I don't, I don't know if you, the hygienists, I mean, they probably should because it's helpful. And I think doctors can understand that better, but how do hygienists learn to forecast what say, for example, like you mentioned, Danielle, a laser or something like that could bring to the practice? Yeah. So I think that it's important to, when you are going to approach the, the dentist that you do have a plan. So whether that be in a business plan or an action plan or something, but how are you going to elevate your standards and the care that you're providing to your patients to make sure that whether that be a laser, say you want to implement the laser, you know, what's the cap what's the ROI on that? What does that look like for the doctor? Because a lot of the time it is about the numbers. So when you do have some kind of, you know, backend report or information from maybe another office that you've had a friend work at, or you go and do a little bit of your own research that you can have some numbers for the doctor. Go ahead, Laura. I know you no. want to talk. No, no. I was just going to say right there, do your research. Yeah. And do your research so that you, you have an action plan, you know what I mean? So you're just not going to them with, I want this. Well, I want this to help my patients get healthy. This is what I've seen. I've done my research. These are the numbers. Is, will this be something feasible that we could work together to implement over the next three to six months? I like it. That would help me. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so too. And I think that that would bring me some comfort saying, okay, they've done all this research. They're super into it. I don't have to do all this research because let's face it, I'm going to call my friends and be like, hey, what laser should I get? You know, so <laughs> I feel like sometimes that's the extent of research that some of us do as dentists. And I feel like that's kind of already set up for us, which I think is really interesting. So, all right, I like that. So this is an action for a hygienist then. So if there's something you would like to implement it, don't bring it up, you know, in between patients or when you catch the doctor walking out of the bathroom, like you want to set up time have that conversation and come prepared to have that discussion. Don't just say, I want this, you know, because I just, I, I want it and I think it's cool. You know, I think that having a real fruitful conversation about it would be useful. All right. I like that. Can I add one for and a dentist? Yeah. Okay, dentist. So when your hygienist or assistant, whomever on the team comes to you with this great idea, and maybe they didn't listen to this episode, so they haven't built that business plan, rather than just shoot them down blindly, what if you suggested somebody go do a little bit of research, tell them maybe what you need to help get you over the hump, and then when your hygienist does the work, yay, and if they don't, then back to you, hygienist, that's on you. Yeah, mm. I love that plan. What do you want to call that? Like dual accountability. I like that. You, I like dual accountability. Reciprocal accountability. <laughs> That's cool. No, I like that. I mean, we see so many hygienists. And now it's interesting because if you are on any sort of social media, you know that there's a quote unquote hygiene shortage and there's a lot of dentists struggling out there. And there's a lot of hygienists that are unhappy and they're looking for another job and they're like, well, if I'm going to be unhappy because hygiene sucks, I might as well make the most money that I can. So if the guy down the street is going to pay me $2 more an hour, I'm just going to go there because every office is the same. Now, you and I all know that that's not the case, but let's talk about what, what hygienists want. You know, like, how do you mm -hmm. get your hygienist to stay? And I mean, while you are struggling, and I mean, a lot of us are struggling. I mean, I had a hard time finding an assistant back in the day. And it was like, sometimes you just have those moments where you're like, if you have a pulse, I will take you. But, you know, obviously that's not always the best approach. But how do you find the people that you want to have be part of your practice? And how do you get them to stay? 
I think that's a wonderful question. I think that comes back to creating that culture. And there's so much more, I mean, this don't want to go down a, a rabbit hole because I think in general, hygienists need to look inward at themselves and, and not just demand a certain dollar amount. They have to see what type of value that they're providing. Um, like I said, that could be a conversation for another day. Um, but I think creating that culture and, and looking at all the other benefits, uh, that, that are provided by working at an office, you know, making sure that, that sometimes you have that downtime to, to decompress and, and talk to your coworkers and, and create that, that, um, that community and that, that, that friendship and, um, realizing that you're, you're building a, a rapport with your coworkers and your patients. Cause I think patients see that through and through, I don't know, Danielle, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that it is important, like Laura was saying, to create a culture, to create an environment where the hygienist feels valued, mm -hmm. to make sure that you have that communication and that connection with the hygienist um, is really important. And working with them, if there is something that they do want to, you know, learn or implement, how can we work together as a team? How can we, you know, both elevate our, ourselves and our careers so that we're providing optimal care to our patients? How do we work together as a team and have better communication? I mean, there's just so many different ways in which I, hygienists can feel fulfilled and valued and not be looking for that $75 an hour, you know, sal or whatever that may be, you know, for that hygienist they can feel fulfilled and valued making that $40 an hour and not go down the street to the other office because they're going to make that extra money because they feel like they're making a difference and they're making an impact and they have great communication and yeah, that autonomy to, to be a great provider. Yeah. And even to create opportunities within the practice for hygienists, like say a hygienist is looking for more of a leadership role. Okay. Well, what can you create within your practice for that hygienist to take on a little bit more responsibility so that they're gaining other, other soft skills that can help them within their career and have that self-fulfillment. It also helps the practice too. It's not like it's just about, you know, fluffing up the hygienist. I mean, these are all skills that will make your practice run better, maybe be more profitable, better patient care. It's not like, you know, we're sitting here saying, all right, dentist, bend over backwards and, <laughs> you know, just make your hygienist happy. It's not really about that. It's really ultimately about the patient. And secondly, you know, the practice, because obviously none of us would have jobs if we didn't have a functional practice. So I think that this is really interesting. So for those that are searching for hygienists, would you say that there's maybe some verbiage that you might put in an ad that might pique the interest of a hygienist? Oh, I always like, I mean, and this is hard, patient-centered care is an, like a, a word or a, a phrase that I love. Um, and that came from a previous, previous office that I worked for. And I did believe that, you know, when I was working there, that we did provide, you know, patient-centered care and the hygienist there never left. I was like the first one to, I think, ever leave that practice ever still. Um, so they do have a, a decent culture. Um, and indeed, and you know, but patient centered care, um, I don't know, Laura, if there's any other key yeah, patient, patient centered care, um, like providing that optimal care, maybe even like uh, saying that you offer new, the latest innovations and technologies. I think that's huge because a lot, a lot of hygienists do want that growth and want to learn and want to know that they have the necessary skills and tools to, to provide that care for their patients. There's a lot to it. I think we could probably do this for 10 hours, but <laughs> Pam, somehow we cranked through 30 minutes again. I don't know where it went. This has been amazing. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the insights. I think a lot of us are kind of treading water here, trying to find a great hygienist, trying to find a great addition to their team, trying to find their forever team. You know, I hear these stories of dental practices that have had these legacy team members forever. And that just doesn't feel like it's the case anymore. So we as dentists need to step it up and create an environment that makes people want to be there. And also 
we want to be there too. It's not just about giving to everybody else, right, David, everybody's smiling, but me, no, we don't want that. We want everybody <laughs> smiling. So Laura, Danielle, thank you guys so much for your time today and for sharing some insights from the other side that I think dentists will certainly find valuable. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure is ours. All right, David, I will see you next week. And everybody for Dentistry Unmasked, we look forward to seeing you next week as well. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you then. Cheers. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening to the show this week. And thanks to our guests and sponsors on this episode. Please check out our social media at Dr. Pamela underscore Maragliano and at Dental Economics Official. Or you can check me out at Ignite DDS or at Dr. David Rice. And go to dentaleconomics.com to receive dental economics. You can choose to receive DE in print or digitally, and you can also get the details of our Principles of Practice Management Conference on our website. If you have time topics or guests or anything you'd like to talk about on the show, send us an email to dentistryunmaskedpodcast at gmail.com and we will do our very best to make it happen. Thanks again and we'll see you next week.